This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, and thank you for joining. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mahmoud Abdu, who is an assistant professor in the Advanced Cardiology here at Emory. Um, Mahmoud went to Benghazi University School of Medicine, followed by internal medicine and cardiology training here at Emory, and then an advanced year of a, a heart failure and transplant fellowship at Indiana University. Uh, came back to Georgia and was with the Northeast Georgia Medical Center for three years before joining yeah, us at Emory this year. Um, I was really impressed by the number of awards that uh, uh, Mahmoud has on his CV from Emory, including Citizenship Award, Teaching Awards, Outstanding Intern Awards, Outstanding Resident Awards. It's just amazing. Um, he has been interested in cardiogenic shock, mechanical circulatory support, and pulmonary hypertension. And he's going to talk to us today about group two pulmonary hypertension. Turn it over to you, Mahmoud. Thank you very much, Pooja, for this nice introduction. And yes, that was in the past. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Um, you know, it's really exciting and uh, an honor to be back on this platform. Um, the last time I was uh, speaking to this uh, distinguished audience was in October, uh, actually October 16th, 2015. It was Friday morning conference. And I spoke about um, uh, echocardiographic guided uh, pericardiosynthesis as my senior fellow ground talk or ground round talk. Um, today, we're going to be talking about something a little different. Um, uh, we're talking about group two pulmonary hypertension. And I chose a subtitle for this. Uh, it, it is, is it the era for hype or hope? Um, this is a field um, that really does not have a lot of um, uh, big time evidence and, and, and research, but the, the as I was telling uh, Pooja earlier that, you know, the field is, is growing and there is promise in the horizon. I have no conflicts. I'll try to, uh, I designed the talk in a way that, you, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the prevalence and impact of pulmonary hypertension, uh, especially in those in cardiac, in, with cardiac disease, um, the pathology and pathophysiology of group two pulmonary hypertension and a novel approach to management and treatment that's probably gonna change the shape of how we practice and how we approach these patients. Simply pulmonary hypertension is an elevation of pulmonary artery pressure. Um, it's defined by an elevation of the mean pulmonary artery pressure beyond normal of 20 to 25 millimeter mercury. It can be detected on echocardiogram uh, by the usual as all of us know, the TR jet velocity, you add on top of that the right atrial pressure uh, assessed by the IVC diameter and compressibility. Uh, if the pulmonary arterial systolic pressure is more than 40 millimeter mercury, you can say that the patient has some sort of pulmonary hypertension. Now, the definition of pulmonary hypertension, the current one that was uh, proposed in the Sixth World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension, WSA, WSPH, in 2018 that happened in Nice, France, caused a little controversy here. Um, the Previously, the hemodynamic definition of pulmonary hypertension was a mean PA pressure of 25. Uh, this was based on an empiric and arbitrary number. Um, during the, that six world symposium, they brought down that cutoff to a PA pressure of 20. And that was based on multiple uh, uh, studies. One, one that really took into consideration was uh, a retrospective analysis conducted in Europe by Kovax and his partners in 2009, where they, rev they reviewed data from um, almost 1,100 patients or normal subjects from 47 studies. And they saw that the mean PA pressure at rest was around 14 plus or minus 3.3. This value was independent of sex and ethnicity and other, uh, and other values. And considering this mean PA pressure of 14, two standard deviation would be would suggest the mean PA pressure of 20 um, as uh, the up, uh, above the upper limit of normal. That puts it around a 97.5 percentile. This definition of a mean PA pressure of 20 millimeter mercury is therefore no longer arbitrary, but, on, uh, but based on scientific approach. For many years, uh, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension was based on an arbitrary number of PA mean PA pressure of 25 and probably a lot of authors and experts in this field think that this was um, understandable 
uh, understandably uh, warranted because of concerns of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. However, today there are growing evidence that in some pulmonary vascular uh, disorders, mainly PAH associated with systemic sclerosis, those that have CTEF and chronic lung disease, Patients with even modest elevation in the mean PA pressure of 21 to 24 have symptoms and have significant exercise limitation and may have poor outcomes. But a, a word of note that whatever the mean PA pressure cutoff that we're going to use, uh, either 25 or 20, it is important to emphasize that this value, um, it, this value it, used in isolation cannot characterize a clinical condition and does not define the pathological process per se. So therefore, to identify uh, the precapillary pH, and we're going to talk about the classification in a few slides, um, suggest in the presence of pulmonary vascular disorders like group 1, group 3, and group 4, an above normal elevation of pulmonary vascular resistance has to be included in the definition. As you can see here, uh, allowing discrimination of elevated PA pressure due to pulmonary vascular disorder or due to elevation of wedge or high uh, cardiac output, therefore emphasizing the need for a right heart cath with mandatory measurement of cardiac output and accurate measure of the wedge and PVR. The classification of pulmonary hypertension really did not change. It's the, your classical WHO group, uh, the five groups, group A being PAH, group two being uh, pulmonary hypertension of left heart disease, which we're going to talk about today group three related to lung disease, group four chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and group five with unclear mechanisms. And the updated uh, six world symposium um, classification, did, it's basically not that much a difference. The main thing that I found um, uh, on top of a few other minor things was this time in class one PAH or class one PAH, which is PAH, they included pulmonary arterial hypertension that uh, with long-term term responders to calcium channel blockers, which is, uh, which is something uh, they felt that it may be a disease entity by itself that's separate from the regular PAH. Um, hopefully we can uh, sp speak about PAH uh, in another uh, session uh, on a different platform perhaps. And it's an, an amazing, amazing how, how, how this disease is, is, is uh, acting and presenting. Other updates to the classification are more, are more minor updates on the drug and toxin uh, induced PAH, uh, some genetic definitions. Um, the other, the other uh, groups remain the same. Few, few cosmetic touches here and there, nothing really different. If we think about pulmonary hypertension, uh, especially in pulmonary hypertension in general and try to understand the classification, think of the pulmonary circulation as a tube. Start with the aorta and trace yourself backwards to the pulmonary capillaries, uh, all the way to the uh, vena cava and the venous system. Uh, the pulmonary capillaries here represent the lung parenchyma. Um, the pH, pH that originates from after the lungs is postcapillary pH, which is group two pulmonary hypertension. Anything originating in the lungs is what we can classify as uh, group three. Uh, Anything that uh, originates here in the uh, pulmonary artery itself or uh, the pulmonary capil uh, pulmonary ca early on in the pulmonary capillaries, we can call class or group one, which is pulmonary arterial hypertension or precapillary hypertension. There's one exception to that, which is pulmonary arterial or group one pH that is related to PVOD and PCH, which is pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. And hemangiomatosis, and those actually, uh, the, the disease originates in the pulmonary veins. 70% of pulmonary hypertension is, called by is caused by left heart disease, group two pulmonary hypertension. 10% um, followed by 10% related to lung disease, and 15% of cases of pulmonary hypertension remain uh, the cause of unknown. Uh, you can see in this chart that pulmonary arterial hypertension is fairly an uncommon disease um, uh, and it's considered actually an orphan disease, despite the plethora uh, and huge arsenal of expensive medications, a lot of side effects used to treat, uh, treat, these medic to treat these patients. However, the majority of patients with pulmonary hypertension will have underlying heart conditions. One point I must mention is that in regards to group three pulmonary hypertension due to COPD, 
COPD rarely causes severe pulmonary hypertension by itself. The most severe form of COPD uh, will cause mild to moderate, hyperten moderate hy pulmonary hypertension at best and rarely causes severe pH. Therefore, if we encounter patients who have smoking, uh, history of smoking, have, um, uh, um, have a diagnosis of COPD on supplemental oxygen at home and have severe pH, we must make an extra effort to identify if there's any underlying cardiac comorbidities that may contribute to the severity uh, of the pulmonary hypertension they're presenting with. Similarly, obstructive sleep apnea um, in isolation alone causes mild, maybe moderate pH by at most. But as we all know, patients rarely fall into well-defined categories like this pie chart. Usually there are coexisting comorbid conditions that patients present with, and that is responsible for their presentation. Commonly, a patient with may have heart failure preserved EF and COPD or CTEF with diastolic dysfunction. Uh, a very common presentation is scleroderma with PAH and then PAH with interstitial lung disease and, heart, and a little bit of HFPEF from that. So uh, this may attribute significantly to over and under treatment of unrecognized uh, or unrecognized pulmonary hypertension for that sake. Um, Therefore, trying to identify the WHO group is very important because the treatment is different. Is pulmonary hypertension, uh, group two pulmonary hypertension prevalent? And that question was answered by the Mayo Clinic back in 2009. This was a, uh, uh, a study done in the community and they found that pulmonary hypertension was very prevalent in the community. Uh, this was a community-based study, 244 patients with HFPEF uh, PA was measured by the echo uh, parameters uh, definition at that time. Uh, in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, approximately a whopping 83% of subjects had pulmonary hypertension compared to the control group, which only had just systemic hypertension with no heart failure. Um, there was only 8% of them developed uh, or had pulmonary hypertension. Why does pulmonary hypertension happen in heart failure? The answer is um, that is straightforward. The higher the left atrial pressure, the higher the PA pressure by passive filling backstream into the pulmonary, excuse me, into the pulmonary circulation. Um, in, in the elderly and, 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 and patients or, or people above the age of 65, it's a little bit more, uh, more um, important to mention. This is another study out of the Mayo Clinic in Olmsted County estimated prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in people above the age of 65 was approximately 12%. The higher the elevation of the PA pressures, the worse the survival. Um, the study actually showed that increasing age by itself is an individual independent marker for worse outcomes in patients with pulmonary hypertension, um, even in the absence of cardiopulmonary disease. So let's just do a little small calculation and math here. If we have 35 million people in the United States above the age of 65, uh, which is projected only to uh, get, be higher in the next decade or two, 4 million of those people will probably have pulmonary hypertension. If 4 million have pulmonary hypertension, we just mentioned that 68% or 70% will have group two pulmonary uh, hypertension. That's around 2.8 million, million people in the United States. This carries a significant burden and impact as we will see in the next few slides. Prevalence of group two pulmonary hypertension, as we know, it, uh, it is a disease of, uh, uh, of the, uh, that manifests as cardiac condition, left heart disease, so chronic systolic heart failure, chronic diastolic heart failure, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, what other terminology we use, there is a, there is a abnormality in the left side of the heart. Um, th these are a collection of studies and there you can see that the, the, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension within different groups of either pulmonary, uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is pretty wide um, for anywhere from 40% to 80%. And uh, you know, the wide range of prevalence probably is related to various definitions of pulmonary hypertension. The modality you use, these are studies that some are echo, some are right heart cath the heterogeneity of the study population. But nonetheless, in both forms of heart failure, either HFREF or HFPEF, pulmonary hypertension appears to be prevalent in a non-negligible percentage of patients. And the bottom line, this is a very common comorbid condition in patients with heart failure. 
The next question that everybody's gonna ask and why do we care? Is this very important? And the, abs and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, mortality associated with group two pulmonary hypertension is not something that it can be overlooked. Um, this, the, this is a result of a study of patients uh, that is out of Italy, I, uh, I, I, I'm guessing, um, I'm, I, I'm, I believe it was done really on 2002. And these are the results of a study of patients with different underlying cardiac etiologies, including cardiomyopathies and myocarditis. And the mortality was associated with higher, uh, uh, higher mean PA pressures and higher wedge pressures in a linear fashion. And the higher the values, the worse the outcome. However, interestingly, the uh, relationship between mortality and increased uh, pulmonary vascular resistance was more, th more so of a threshold, more, more threshold-like threshold fashion, sorry. PVR, um, uh, more than three uh, woods units was associated with worse outcomes. And this doesn't come uh, in total surprise to me because you know there's examples uh, of different other different clinical situations where the cutoff of the PVR of three made, uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, for example, um, the PVR more than three is already used as a threshold value for which uh, correction of congenital systemic to pulmonary shunts become questionable. Uh, we use the uh, cutoff of three uh, in, in the tran in cardiac transplant world uh, as uh, the a PVR above three prior to transplant carries a uh, uh, poor survival after heart transplantation. Let's talk about uh, uh, the classification of group two pulmonary hypertension. This is the old nomenclature, um, you know, uh, systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, HFREF or HFPEF, valvular heart disease. All these will cause WHO group two pulmonary hypertension. Those are usually uh, further divided into two, either passive pulmonary hypertension, passive group two pulmonary hypertension, or mixed group two pulmonary hypertension. And this is the uh, hemodynamic definition of both. Since 2015, uh, we stopped using that nomenclature system, and now we're talking about uh, the previously known as passive group two pulmonary hypertension is now known as isolated postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. Those who have mixed pulmonary hypertension are now classified as combined pre and postcapillary hypertension (CPCPH) or IPCPH. Um, the changes of the name, however, did not really change the hemodynamic definition. Uh, that remained almost the same, except that now it's widely accepted that uh, the diastolic pulmonary gradient is an essential part of um, the hemodynamic definition and because it carries a uh, prognostic value uh, that is very strongly uh, 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 scientifically uh, uh, validated in, in studies. And diastolic pr pressure gradient is the, basically your uh, PA diastolic pressure minus your wedge. It all starts with uh, high left atrial pressure uh, in all forms of postcapillary post group two pulmonary hypertension. In, ICP, in IPCPH, which is isolated uh, postcapillary pulmonary hypertension, passive congestion alone will cause um, a, a, an increase in the PA pressures to rise. No vascular remodeling has yet occurred. But as the disease state continues and congestion persists, remodeling starts to begin and causes the pulmonary vascular resistance to start to rise. Early on, it is still in the reactive phase where diuretics and vasodilators may cause um, improvement in hemodynamics, but once remodeling is complete, it will become an irreversible process and CPCPH occurs. And this is a difficult to treat situation with high mortality and poor prognosis. The problem with group two pulmonary hypertension and uh, uh, and you know combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension is that the ultimate sacrifice is paid by the poor right ventricle. Um, uh, the ultimate sacrifice is done in in those patients. The way it, this is caused is by a backward transmission um, or backflow phenomena. I like to think of it as a water hose. Um, there's a plug downstream, the elevated left atrial pressure. This causes congestion and increase in uh, volume uh, upstream through the pulmonary veins that's transmitted to pulmonary capillaries, pulmonary arterioles, and eventually reaches the right ventricle. As we all know, the right ventricle is a low pressure chamber. 
it can handle uh, volume very well. And initially that's what happens, passive congestion and the RV starts to kind of try to accommodate that. It's coming in in a low kind of pressure of, uh, to say it starts to dilate, but it maintains its function relatively well. But as the left side system, both the left atrium and left ventricle remains poorly loaded and, 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 and suboptimal, the pulmonary vascular remodeling starts happening. And when that happens, pulmonary vasoconstriction, pulmonary arteriovasculature, uh, whatever you want to call it, starts kind of constrict, and that becomes an irreversible process. The RVE becomes overwhelmed with the high pressure that's facing, which isn't meant to handle, and the RV pays the hefty price of this transaction and will start to fail. Here, the disease process will start to resemble more of a pre-capillary pH, which is pulmonary arterial hypertension group one, hence the name CPCPH or combined pre and post capillary hypertension at that point, the pulmonary vascular compliance decreases. There's no uh, good response to vasodilators and ultimately renal congestion, hepatic congestion, all other manifestations of right heart failure happens. And at that point, biventricular failure will lead to death. This is, uh, uh, you know, trying to demonstrate the multi-hit cause of pulmonary hypertension in heart failure or preserved ejection fraction. These patients do not present in isolation. They have a wide array of comorbidities, uh, including, uh, including chronic kidney disease, high blood pressure, metabolic syndrome and diabetes, valve disease, age by itself, as was also um, identified. Uh, lung disease, obstructive apnea, so on and so forth, you know, not forgetting atrial fibrillation as well. So, you know, a lot of comorbidities with these patients. Not only hemodynamically and pathophysiologically does CPCPH act as a as precapillary pulmonary hypertension, but the survival and mortality of this form of pulmonary hypertension resembles that of PAH. Um, this is the people who don't have pulmonary hypertension and with this first stage of, uh, of group two pulmonary hypertension, which is isolated proscapillary pulmonary hypertension, you can see that the survival is lower, of course, than regular than the normal population, but it's still relatively better than as we tend to progress. Look at when we get to the fixed CPCPH and almost resembles early on resembles uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is precapillary pH. I hope I can convince you that in the next few slides that this is a, 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 morbid, con a morbid condition. Um, this, these are histopathological slides that, show, that are post-mortem, un unfortunately, um, with, you know, patients with different, um, different hemodynamic changes are with group 2 pulmonary hypertension. This slide, the first slide, slide A, these are patients who have early on isolated proscapillary pulmonary hypertension, TPG of three. You can see these are the pulmonary arteries. Not a lot of remodeling happened here with the tri trichrome stain, stain, sorry. As we progress, the, this is um, a, patient's, a patient who have a TPG of 15 and a, a diastolic uh, a pulmonary gradient of five you can start seeing some remodeling here, not that significant. As the disease progressed, look at uh, slide C, you can see the significant remodeling, thickening of the intima of the pulmonary arteries, and um, a, a, lot of, a lot of vascular remodeling happening here with advanced CPCPH. Compared to D, which is idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, for the First glance at it, you don't see a big difference. Look at the intimal fibrosis and remodeling here. It's almost identical. So this is a disease that has significant um, um, uh, morbidity, even on a histopathological level. Arterialization of pulmonary veins with double elastic lamina happens as well. You know, pulmonary veins are usually um, uh, disregarded or overlooked, but in group two pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary vein remodeling is another hallmark of this disease. Usually it's an overlooked component, but recently people have been looking into this as it has major implications and, ut and utility in future therapeutic options. As you know, uh, drugs, there's, there's certain, there are some drugs that are now targeting pulmonary veins and preventing their remodeling and inducing, uh, uh, inducing improvement in, in some patients. So, more on uh, more to see in this regard. 
management, and this is where we're going to focus most of our uh, uh, of our talk and, and, and attention. And the first step in management, as we all know, uh, we look at the guidelines. What does the guideline say for group two pulmonary hypertension management of these patients? And unfortunately, not a lot. Um, the only uh, class one recommendation from the European Society of Cardiology was optimization and treatment of underlying condition, which we all know. Uh, refer to a pulmonary hypertension center of expertise if you're uh, really facing trouble. And the thing that you should not do is use of pulmonary RT or hypertension approved therapies in pulmonary hypertension with left heart disease. We start our initial diagnostic evaluation as usual. Uh, our normal, what we do as cardiologists, we get an EKG, we uh, get some imaging, either echocardiogram or cardiac MRI. I think cardiac MRI is very important in this arena. Uh, you know, a pulmonary function test is, is helpful. You get your six minute walk test and you assess hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamically by invasive measure, measures with the right heart catheterization. Um, the, uh, PA catheter swan has a, a, a pivotal role here in evaluation of these patients, but not every patient needs the right heart cath to establish the diagnosis of uh, PH with left heart disease. The patient on cardiac imaging has clear signs of LV dysfunction or valvular heart disease uh, with elevated PA systolic pressure on echo. This establishes the diagnosis. However, right heart cath and invasive hemodynamic data is pivotal in situations where uh, there's persistent symptoms. You want to see and measure your PA pressures and monitor them, uh, manager, ma management of underlying etiology and condition. Um, at that point, the right heart cath is uh, necessary. Sometimes, uh, and a lot of times, we use flu fluid challenge or exercise challenge um, and, and if, if the resting hemodynamics are not really uh, giving us the answer. These are a list of the measure parameters that are essential, the RA pressure, the PA pressure, both systolic, diastolic, and mean, and wedge pressure. Um, you know, these measurements are important and they really need to be done accurately um, in the cath lab. Um, because, you know, as, as you can imagine that the management will differ depending on these numbers that you get. These are just not any measures, measurements that you take randomly and you take easily. A lot of times uh, you see a right heart cath reports where the wedge is higher than the PA diastolic pressure and that cannot happen. I mean, that does not physiologically make any, make any sense. Blood has to flow. Your wedge cannot, it can not be higher than diastolic PA pressure. That's not a super physiological phenomena that happens or so that's basically a human error or like a failure to measure accurately uh, or measure your hemodynamics accurately. There are some derived measures or parameters, your transpulmonary gradient, diastolic pulmonary gradient. Uh, we use a lot in evaluating these patients. Of course, you're getting your cardiac output to, do, to uh, derive your pulmonary vascular resistance. A lot of other uh, fancy equations to measure PA compliance, elastins, uh, uh, elastins, and so on and so forth. Just a word of note here that not all these parameters or these equations need to be done on one single patient. There's a lot of um, now work done with the RV in, in the setting of shock, uh, cardiogenic shock. So some equations you use for shock, some you use for pulmonary hypertension. But anyways, I'd I, I would love just to have this uh, table on for reference of how uh, much data you can derive from your um, uh, hemodynamic parameters. Let's talk about the management of this, disease, of this disease and how we can treat these patients and see if they're in any hope of these for these people or this is all hype. Uh, let's start with uh, this principle of management, which I think it's a novel way to think about a disease, and uh, maybe it's can it can be applied to different uh, other other diseases that we treat as cardiologists in, in the heart failure arena, especially. But for management of pulmonary hypertension with left heart disease, group two pulmonary hypertension, the central principle in successful management of these type of patients is the, manage, uh, the management of the LA pressure. The LA pressure is in the, the center of all this. Uh, and if you want the, these patients to do well, you really want to control the left atrial pressure um, with decongestion and, 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 and remodeling and all these things to the LA. Uh, 
Followed by that, the two core principles that are important is management of the underlying substrate, followed by an attempt to induce vascular remodeling and prevent the progression of the disease on a vascular, uh, on a vascular sta stage. The long-term management emphasizes on the continuous treatment of each of these layers simultaneously, forming this three-pronged approach to the management of pulmonary hypertension. Left atrial pressure management, underlying, uh, sub management of the underlying substrate, and finally, pulmonary vascular remodeling. This is a beautiful and promising uh, treatment model work done by uh, work done and proposed by Dr. Ray Benza during his time in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's now moved to Ohio State University in Columbus, and he still carries on uh, research in this arena. I think he's the only, uh, he's very prominent in this field, and he's the only one who uh, has really uh, did some invasive hemodynamic monitoring at home with ambulatory devices and so forth. We're going to see in the next few slides in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So let's take each element or each component of this three-pronged approach and see what we can do about it. The first one is the management of the LA pressure. We all know that the rate of pulmonary edema is related directly to the increase in, LA, uh, in the uh, uh, pressure in the left atrium. Hence, um, the pulmonary arterial uh, pulmonary pressures uh, are related to the rapidity, duration, and magnitude in the elevation of hydrostatic pressure in the left atrium. We know that uh, repeated left atrial pressure with acute on chronic increase in PA pressure leads to worsening RV function and uh, eventually RV failure with frequent hospitalizations leading to uh, CPCPH, which is uh, highly morbid. Um, we don't want it to reach that, that stage. This emphasizes the importance of left atrial pressure monitoring and left atrial pressure management and underscores it as being the main principle of the three-pronged approach. What modalities do we have? We have diuretics and the key success, I need to really emphasize this, is that you're not your random use of diuretics. You uh, uh, inject a few, few, few milligrams of Lasix here and there. No, it has to be kind of a more of a protocol driven. You have to be aggressive with your management. You really need to dry these patients out um, and decongest them as much as possible. And the only way to do this, in my opinion, um, is in a protocol driven, uh, frequent adjustments, paying a lot of attention to a lot of details, you're monitoring a lot of biochemical serum biomarkers, um, the clinical biomarkers. So it, it needs to be something done in really uh, well-designed fashion. Use of nitrates can be uh, helpful. There are surgical, um, there are surgical indication or methods of um, improvement of the left atrial pressure as well. These include uh, left atrial pumps. Um, this is experimental, not for clinical use. A very nice paper by Dr. Burkhoff um, mentioned this and a lot of uh, very beautiful data coming out of that. Um, use of interarterial shunts, this is promising. It's still in an infancy. Think people are looking into this, and hopefully, we will have some more uh, data that are um, uh, promising in the in the next in, uh, next few years. Hopefully, use of LVADs. Um, you know, and again, very similar to diuretics. You put an LVAD. You you want to really optimize it. You know, you, you you can't have an LVAD sitting there, and the left atrial pressure is still not optimized. And this is another key, important key factor to success in trying to make sure that you really unload the left atrium ventricle and load the left atrium as well. A word of no, a caution here that um, I'm mentioning LVAD not for pulmonary hypertension, but the LVAD indication remains the usual ACCHA stage mm -hmm. D heart failure whenever it's indicated. Underlying substrate management, uh, of course, these patients will have heart failure and valvular heart, valvular heart disease. So treatment of heart failure, your guideline directed medical therapy for HEFREF. Um, you, I wanna emphasize the importance of neurohormonal modulation, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, ARNIs, um, uh, also your mineral corticoid uh, antagonists uh, is a very important. Uh, caution with beta blockers, uh, with severe right ventricular dysfunction, sometimes you can get in trouble with that. However, still, your aggressive guideline-directed medical therapy for HEFREF, aggressive volume optimization for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, UCRT whenever uh, indicated, strict blood pressure control, 
control of other comorbid conditions, obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, mm -hmm. AFib, uh, if patients have uh, sleep apnea, treat that, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, consider correction of any valvular abnormalities you use. Uh, refer, if the patients have, uh, have HOCAM, uh, refer them for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy surgery and intervention. Um, you know, the, this is important. I, I just want to show an interesting um, study from 1972 with Dr. Shamway, one of the pioneers in heart transplant surgery. You know, this comes in no surprise that uh, you, you treat the valvular condition, uh, you, you know, your pulmonary, pulmonary pressures improve. What about pulmonary vascular remodeling and the use of specific therapies, uh, these PAH specific therapies, PDE5 inhibitors, IV prostaglandins, um, uh, ERAs, the guanolite cyclase stimulators, sildenafil, tadalafil, riosigwat, mesotentan, IV uh, ipoprostenil, all these things. I want to make sure that uh, I, I, I drive this message, uh, you know, clearly, but if you jump on this step before the first two steps, using pulmonary vascular remodeling agents, pH specific therapies, prior to controlling of your left atrial pressure and underlying substrate, uh, the, the non-conditioned left ventricle, the failing left ventricle or the stiff left ventricle with high left atrial pressure is not ready to receive that extra blood flow that results from pulmonary vasodilation. The left atrial will continue to rise, the, or sorry, the left atrial pressure will continue to rise worsening pulmonary edema will happen and a, a big ventilation perfusion mismatch and this will lead into worsening hypoxia, worsening symptoms and eventually will lead to worsening right ventricular ischemia and the patient will suffer. From my experience so far, um, for patients referred to me for pulmonary hypertension, usually they, I found that they're group two pulmonary hypertension I have actually stopped more pulmonary vasodilators than starting them. Uh, patients will be volume overloaded with elevated left atrial pressures or wedge pressures. The hemodynamic conditions of the left ventricle is way suboptimal on unaddressed valvular abnormalities. This happens all the time. And the patient with cessation of these uh, therapies and going back to focusing on management of the left atrial pressure and the underlying substrate, they start to feel better without these fancy uh, drugs that they've been on. And do I have evidence for that? And absolutely, yes. I mean, we tried these agents in, on heart failure and uh, you can see uh, this is more than eight, seven or eight trials. And, and you know, these trials, all, all, all of them were negative. Um, you know, PAH medications do not work in heart failure. The reason for this though, you need to be, we need to be fair that these trials were not designed for pulmonary hypertension. These did not control for left atrial pressure. They did not really have protocols driven for uh, drying out patients, so on and so forth. Even if we did control for pulmonary hypertension, and this is a nice study done by Javed Butler and, and analyzing some studies that um, have been done, um, utilizing pulmonary hypertension specific therapy failed to yield strong evidence of success with negative or the best or at best neutral effects. Um, other large uh, randomized controlled studies were not so convincing as all of these uh, trials, again, lack protocols for controlling left atrial pressure and adequate diuresis and volume optimization. So let's say if we control the left atrial pressure, control the underlying substrate, and now we are trying to use um, these pulmonary vascular remodeling agents, are all agents the same? And to be effective, um, in, in, in this, so, so on, this is another uh, paper by Dr. Benza and his group that showed that um, those agents that work on the cyclic GMP and, uh, uh, and PKG axis lead to improved ventricular vascular coupling. PDE5 inhibitors, sildenafil and hadelafil, and um, soluble guanolate cyclase stimulators like triosigwat lead to increased cyclic GMP and nitric oxide resulting in improved coronary and systemic endothelial function. This results in, uh, from animal models proposed decreased left ventricular hypertrophy, decreased fibrosis due to pressure overload, and improves left ventricular relaxation. Uh, 
in general, uh, PAH therapy um, medications should not be used unless left atrial pressure and the underlying substrate have been accounted for and preferably used in, a, as in the setting of a clinical trial. So are there any clinical trials ongoing? And the answer is yes, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, wide range of other um, uh, modalities of treatments have been going on. And uh, hopefully we can be part of those trials and see if we can help these patients and participate. So the three prong approach, left atrial pressure management, control of the underlying substrate, pulmonary vascular remodeling, all those, you, you, you have them in, in harmony. You, you start with a layer after layer, start with the left atrial pressure and go down. But again, you need to kind of emphasize on the long-term management with continuous and consistent monitoring. Uh, a multi-modality approach, multiple touch points with patients, and you treat and monitor simultaneously. How do you monitor these patients? Um, way to monitor the LA pressure by clinical visits and vital signs and physical exams. We tried this, it sh showed poor sensitivities and a lot of randomized control trials. Neurohormonal monitoring with BNP and NT-pro BNP. This demonstrated a big failure in the guided uh, trial. Uh, he, uh, home telemonitoring is not very successful. Underlying substrate and remodeling uh, requires clinical visits, repeat imaging, uh, repeat hemodynamics. The problem with these modalities, they possess limited limitation to number of touch points with the patient, requiring the patient to come over to the office or the hospital. Repeating our heart cats and hemodynamics also is not practical as it will only give us a snapshot of hemodynamics in time while the patient is supine and resting and not reflection of the overall patient performance. Also, repeat heart cath um, is not cost effective and is invasive. What about monitoring with Doppler? Doppler echocardiogram assessment is an unreliable method for monitoring PA pressures. So if an echo is done and there is evidence of pulmonary hypertension by Doppler, this is by no means should be ignored. In fact, this should raise attention um, uh, that, you know, that uh, and, and requires action. So um, here's one of my take home points. If pulmonary hypertension is diagnosed, um, you monitor response of therapies or interventions by measurement of the PA pressure should not be done by echo. So do not rely on Doppler by following PA systolic pressure. Uh, that does not mean that the echo has no role in monitoring of the progression of the disease. On the, on, uh, on the other hand, it's the opposite. Uh, other parameters of RV size, RV systolic function by TAPSI, whatever you want to monitor, these are extremely important uh, and echo does still have a major role in monitoring of the disease. This is a study done by uh, Jonathan Rich and, and his group and in, in, uh, in the studies in 160 patients they correlate shows that uh, correlation of right heart cath and echo and measurement of PA pressures found that despite the statistically significant number in the R value, which is correlation, this was inaccurate in 51% of the time. So 50% of the time, if you follow Doppler echo, you are right and 50% you are wrong. Similar findings were found by uh, another group of uh, uh, the Hopkins group and uh, showed identical results one year prior to publishing of this study. So this is, is there other things that we can do? And, and I think the implantable hemodynamic monitoring by using a PA pressure sensors with cardio MEMS um, is, is something that is promising. And this is work done by Dr. Benza, and he's the only one who has done this um, approach in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension patients. And we learned from the CHAMPION trial that uh, the window of opportunity to prevent um, uh, clinical decompensation and hospitalization can be detected uh, way in advance by implantable continuous hemodynamic monitoring um, th almost 30 days prior to the event by leveraging this concept. Uh, it, actually, Dr. Benza was able to uh, balance the mo uh, monitoring of, our, uh, of patients with pulmonary hypertension uh, in a three-pronged approach as well. This is a, 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 a snapshot of the CardioMEMS uh, interface, how it looks like on our end. This is a patient of mine that was frequently admitted to the hospital almost every month, six hospitalizations in 2020. Um, in, in August, I implanted a cardio MEMS device in her and she's been out of the hospital since. You can see that every time we see a small rise in the PA diastolic pressure here, we intervene and, um, and we tell her to do whatever we, she needs to do and that may kept her out of the hospital. This is an exploratory, uh, non-randomized, uncontrolled feasibility trial, 26 patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, group one disease, 
Um, they used CardioMEMS uh, for daily mon uh, hemodynamic monitoring, um, uh, and they followed them for four years. Interestingly, what in the study, the uh, Pittsburgh group, what they did was they utilized the PA pressure waveform. They used the mean PA pressure and heart rate using a proprietary algorithm by Abbott in the CardioMEMS device and derived a calculated cardiac output. They used that cardiac output to assess RV function and guide their therapy for PAH, group one disease. And this is an example. Uh, this is a patient with acute right ventricular failure in the setting of medication non-compliance here in the blue. He started falling back on taking his medication, him or her taking her medications. And the, uh, you know, you can see the pulmonary artery pressures starting to rise. They intervened, they bring the, brought the patient back into the hospital it reinitiated aggressive diuretics, and then you can see how things uh, improve overall. The study concluded, uh, of course, this is an experimental study. More clinical trials need to be done before establishing this method and recommending a standard in management, but certainly brings uh, hope in the near future about management of this expensive, highly morbid and highly moral disease. So I hope, uh, I hope by, uh, you know, uh, at the end here that I uh, demonstrated that pulmonary hypertension is very prevalent among patients with cardiac disease. I do think that pulmonary hypertension is a cardiac disease, despite the first name of it being pulmonary. Group two pulmonary hypertension is associated with worse outcomes and increased mortality. Um, you know, not all pulmonary hypertension patients are treated the same. You really need to classify these patients and know the etiology. It's um, a, a three-pronged approach, sounds and looks very promising and has a lot of, uh, makes a lot of sense clinically. And hopefully with more data in the future with therapeutics and monitoring uh, uh, with ongoing and emerging clinical trials, we will be have, uh, we'll hopefully we can find hope for these patients. And by that, I will end and I'll be happy to ha answer any questions. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, while we're waiting for questions, um, I'll start off with one. Um, you know, one of the things that I find challenging is these classifications for pH in general. So for example, in clinical care, you know, we'll, you know, you'll have a patient who has, for example, scleroderma or HIV, and then they have high pH pressures, plus they have LV, you know, let's say they have diastolic dysfunction. And so, you know, in clinical care, we don't say like, oh, she has group one and group two. Um, so, how, you know, tell me your approach about, you know, where you would put that person. That, that is correct. And that's where you, you know, that's absolutely 100% accurate. You know, in practice, these patients don't fit into a certain category. Like you said, the patient has HIV or scleroderma, most likely they, and they have and high PA pressures, most likely they will have group one disease. But because of scleroderma may cause diastolic dysfunction, so they will have group two on top of that. At, on top of that, if the patient is in their 50s or so and they smoke for a little bit, they will have underlying lung disease. Mm -hmm. If they have rheumatoid, they'll have interstitial lung disease and they'll have group three. So at that point, it's kind of hard to determine. Where it's important as uh, the role for us is Let's determine, you know, there's a problem here. It's associated with higher mortality. Let's start the process of evaluation. Get an echocardiogram. Let's assess how much a burden, let's say if you do an echo on this person that you just mentioned, and they have only like mild diastolic dysfunction. So most likely the pulmonary, the pulmonary hypertension that they have is less likely due to group two. And the drive of that is probably group one. At that point, you know, they need to be referred for a right heart cath and, you know, in really aggressive uh, management here needs to be done in order for us to make these patients uh, feel better and have a more uh, improved quality of life kind of thing. Thank you. So, Mahmoud, this, Mahmoud, this is Andy. Um, I think that a lot of the terminology that we use um, often confuses uh, what we're dealing with. Um, so, uh, for instance, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, a lot of people think that that actually means that there's a normal cardiac output, often when there's not. Correct. Pulmonary artery hypertension type 2, really what that's telling you is that you're dealing with a problem of the left heart 
and not necessarily a problem with specifically with pulmonary hypertension. I would not call pulmonary artery hypertension type two a disease. Um, you know, I, I think it's a it's a result of something that's that's going on elsewhere. And you know, I just think a lot of these terms that we use lead ultimately to some inappropriate uh, therapies. Now, the um, in in a big area of, of patients with with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we're learning that it's not so much a hemodynamic, possibly a hemodynamic issue, but it may be an issue of inflammation, and that that issues that where we where we've tried to just target um, vasodilator type treatments and and that type of thing is leading us down the same road that we went with systolic heart failure in the 80s. Uh, where we later learned that uh, neurohormonal antagonists and beta blockers and things like that were were work, were work going to be uh, helpful. So those are just a few comments and caveats. And then just the final comment is that if you look at left heart failure and what drives hospitalizations, um, it's really increased pressures drive hospitalizations more than um, than cardiac output per se. Um, we know that with the implantable hemodynamic monitors, we, we were working with the chronicle monitor previously, now with the cardiomems. But if you can get that pressure, that estimated pulmonary artery diastolic pressure down below 20, that's associated with many fewer hospitalizations, probably as you point out in the patient that, that you had. And likewise, cardiorenal syndrome is also predominantly very likely predominantly pressure driven. That is, it's driven by high venous pressures and not so much by low cardiac output. So I think pressure is very important, and, um, but, but how we lower pressures potentially indirectly and not directly is, is what's, what's going to make a difference in, in these folks. I totally agree with you, Dr. Smith, and, uh, you, you know, um, Pressure is important and more so a lot of people once they, you know, they, they always think of heart failure as low cardiac output. Every, that's the first thing that people come that uh, comes to people's mind. And actually, you're absolutely right. I like the way you phrased it. It's a more of a pressure phenomena and all the worst things, uh, you know, cardiorenal syndrome, um, the pulmonary hypertension itself, uh, you know, this group two is, 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 a, is a pressure phenomena. I think that's very important. And a lot of time this is over, overlooked. As far as the terminology, I totally agree with you. It is confusing, um, especially, you know, that they are very close to each other. So PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension, that's something very, very different. Um, that's a disease by itself. That's group one. Um, the others are called pulmonary hypertension. I wish they came up with another name for it, uh, especially in 2018 when they decided on changing the cl uh, classification criteria, but they didn't. Um, so I understand, you know, I agree with you. It's a little confusing. Now we have IPCPH, CPCPH, DPG, and what's that? But um, if you look at it a little bit more closer, it actually it makes a lot of sense, especially if you have some uh, interest in this. But um, I agree, it can be a little confusing. So let, let me ask you this question then. If, if, if you were to ask me, and, and maybe my understanding is going off, but if, if there was a potential treatment for type two pulmonary hypertension right now, I would say that it might be, based upon some emerging evidence, might be SGLT2 inhibition. Um, based upon what we know about what that, those medicines are beginning to look like, both in preserved ejection fraction um, and reduced ejection fraction. So is that, am I like totally off base stating that? No, I don't think so. I don't think that there's going to be uh, a specific medication or a magic wand that we're going to um, uh, like wave on these patients and they're going to get better. I think we just need to, you know, as more we treat heart failure better, we treat the valvular abnormalities better, this, these patients will feel better. I don't think that there is one specific medication, but I have a strong feeling that this SGL2T receptor blockers are going to make a big, huge difference in the, in the in coming up in the future, we'll just need to wait and see uh, the very long-term effects of it. I agree. Um, I have another comment about this slide that you have yes. uh, pulled up here. 
Yes. Can you comment on uh, this being a moving target? So is it possible that you have a patient who's, let's say, a little volume overloaded or uncontrolled hypertension or what have you, that their DPG is greater than seven, so you think that they are CPCPH, but then, you know, you optimize them and they end up in, I, I mean, do they go back and forth between these two? Um, That's a really good question. And, and you can see here, down here, it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's subdivided, right? Early on, early on in CPCPH, and I'll show you the slide in a little bit, with vasodilators and diuretics, you bring down their TPG, you bring down their DPG, and you may actually have better control here. But sometimes it's irreversible when the vascular remodeling already happened, both pulmonary arterial vascular remodeling, pulmonary venous vascular remodeling, and at that point it will becomes irreversible. So you're right, early on, it is a reversible phenomena, and it, this was called reactive and you can bring them back uh, up here, but so sometimes you cannot. And this is another slide that may help uh, with, with your question. I hope it will answer it. But as the disease progressive, you see this is the patient that you've been talking about. This is where he, the patient is in right now. Try to diarese them, optimize them. If they are reactive, if it's still in the reactive phase and remodeling is starting to happen and you still have some room, you will bring them back up and you can uh, get them better. But if it's already irreversible, no matter what you do, I think at that point you are, are um, it, it's in the fixed CPCPH. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. Any other questions or comments? I, I guess, this is Spencer, uh, I guess the failure of the drug therapies uh, speaks against uh, you being able to do a lot about this reactive phase, except to treat the uh, left uh, heart condition. But uh, there's one other therapy that was out there and I don't know if it went away or not, but our colleague from uh, Nanjing, China, Xiaoling Chen, uh, uh, did these experiments with uh, uh, denervation of the pulmonary arteries uh, as in renal denervation. And he, got, he, he had some stuff he, we published in uh, in uh, Jack and in Jack intervention. Has that gone away? Is there anything there? Uh, you think that's just bogus or, or what do you think about it? You know, Dr. King, I, I mean, I've, I've came when, during my training and I, 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 I came across, we came across this, this has mentioned, been mentioned to me about the pulmonary artery denervation. Um, I don't think it really took off. Um, in all honesty, I did not really uh, do a literature search on this for particularly for this topic. I wish I did, uh, but I don't think that it really took off and had a lot of uh, success. I think it was more very, very primitive, and I don't think that it was very successful. But yes, there had been uh, a look into that, very similar to the renal artery derivation, like you mentioned. But Spencer, Andy, again, hearing you make a comment, just, um, you know, as he pointed out, in elderly people this becomes more common but one of the things that may prevent this in elderly is exercise um, and exercise with people when they're in their 60s and 70s uh, can prevent a stiff ventricle when they get into their 80s and can also potentially improve baroreceptor uh, function uh, we had a speaker from UT Southwestern a few years ago who, who pointed some of that out so if, if we want to pre prevent diastolic dysfunction, prevent secondary pulmonary hypertension um, in aging, then uh, we need to be encouraging our patients to, to exercise at younger ages. Sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, um, we're a little past 8.30 now, so we'll go ahead and close and uh, see everyone next week. Thanks again, Mahmoud. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.